In our last PowerPoint, we talked about Mendelian genetics. Mendelian genetics is nice and simple. I mentioned before that we're very lucky that Mendel picked these nice, easy examples. He did that kind of accidentally. But with Mendelian genetics, we can anticipate, we can predict certain ratios. So if we're talking about one gene with two different alleles and one is dominant to the other, Remember that in our F2 generation, our second filial generation, we'll see that three to one ratio of dominant to recessive traits. If we're talking about two genes and those genes assort independently, and what I mean by that is they're on different chromosomes generally, then we can expect to see a nine to three to three to one ratio in our second filial generation. But this is unusual because most traits, most characteristics, are not coded for by two forms of one gene or two forms of two genes. They're coded for by lots of genes that are interacting with each other in very complex ways. And that's what we'll take a brief look at today. We'll look at non-Mendelian genetics, which is really how most biology works. The ratios created by Simple Mendelian genetics are simple because we're dealing with cases where we have genes that come in two flavors and one overrides the other. This is known as complete dominance. So if we have two dominant alleles, we'll see the dominant phenotype, which is usually the wild type or normal phenotype. But even if we just have one, if we have one of these dominant alleles, that's enough to give us the dominant phenotype. This is something known as haplosufficiency, haplo meaning half. So if just half of the alleles are dominant, just one out of the two is dominant, that is sufficient to give us the wild type phenotype. But today, among other things, we'll talk about a condition known as haploinsufficiency. And this is where if we have one fully functional allele, it's not sufficient to give us the wild type phenotype. So it doesn't completely override the recessive. In fact, we generally get something that's kind of halfway in between the dominant phenotype and the recessive phenotype. We have two conditions we'll talk about, and that's incomplete dominance and codominance. Before we do that, though, I just want to point out that although the dominant allele generally codes for the normal trait, the wild type trait, that isn't always the case. There are a few exceptions. And here is a good example. Polydactyly is where you have too many digits. You have too many fingers or toes, as you can see in the x-rays here from a child that has this condition. In this situation, we have an allele of the gene that codes for a protein that's too active. It does its job too well. So this gene, codes for a protein that promotes growth. What it actually does is it turns on a bunch of other genes. It promotes growth in the developing hand and foot and we get too many digits. So here we have a case where the broken gene is actually dominant and it overrides the normal gene, which would be recessive. Okay, back to that haploinsufficiency thing that I introduced. In this example here, this picture that you're seeing is of a cow that is heterozygous for a particular gene. This is a gene that's needed to make the brown pigmentation of the cow. That would be the wild type situation, a brown cow. But in this heterozygous individual, we're seeing two different colors. So we have a dominant gene that codes for the brown color, and we have a recessive gene, a broken form of that gene, that results in a white color. And we would expect, following simple Mendelian complete dominance, that this cow would be brown. But it's not, we're seeing both of those traits. This is an example of codominance. We'll come back to exactly what that means in a moment but we're seeing a combined phenotype. We're seeing the brown from the dominant allele, and we're also seeing the white from the recessive allele 
in this heterozygous individual. In some heterozygous individuals, the two traits, the dominant trait and the recessive trait, are actually blended. So here we have an example where the red pigmentation is a dominant trait, the white is a recessive trait. So that red flower has two dominant alleles that code for that red coloration. The white flower is homozygous recessive. It has two broken forms of those genes. And if we mate these two flowers in the F1, in our first generation of offspring, we get a pink flower. And the reason for that is that the heterozygous doesn't make enough of that protein to bring us up to a threshold where we get a red flower. So I mentioned before that in complete dominance, let's say we've got a gene that codes for an enzyme. So long as we have at least one working version of the gene coding for that enzyme, that's enough. That's enough enzyme. But in this case, having only one functional gene doesn't give us enough enzyme to get the full red color. So we get something halfway in between. So that's incomplete dominance where things are blended together. In codominance, we see both of the traits, the recessive and the dominant, but they're not blended together, they're separate. So you can see that in the flower at the bottom here, we can see separate bits that are white and separate bits that are red, just like that cow that we talked about a moment ago. Let's take another look at that flower example. So again, let's say we had a red flower and it's red because it's homozygous dominant. And we cross that with a white flower, which is homozygous recessive. And let's say we get a pink flower. That is incomplete dominance. We have a blending of the two traits. The incomplete part means that the dominant allele does not completely overwhelm the effects of the recessive allele. If we end up with the flower on the right there, so if the heterozygous individual is striped, so we see separate red bits and separate white bits, that's codominance. So each of those alleles, the dominant and the recessive, are having an effect on different parts of the flower. They're acting together in a cooperative way. Let's have a look at a Punnett square for incomplete dominance. And we're gonna look at that flower example again. So we're going to mate red flowers with white flowers. Now there's lots of different ways that you could name the alleles. You could come up with your own lettering system. What they've decided to do here is use C, presumably because it stands for color, and then they've got two superscripts. They've got a big R, which would be the red allele, and a big W, which is the uh, white allele. Now, the reason they've done this, instead of going with like big W, little W, or big R, little R, something like that, is because they're trying to show that one gene can't override the other, or I should say one allele of the gene cannot override the other allele. They're actually being blended together in the F1 generation. So in the F1 generation, we have a blended phenotype. And once again, just think about how lucky Mendel was to come up with a number of traits. He was very observant. He looked for these traits, but he was very lucky to find traits in his pea plants that showed complete dominance. If he had decided just to use traits like this, he might have concluded that, well, the blending hypothesis of inheritance is correct, and he might have just stopped right there. Anyway, if we do our Punnett square, what we're doing in this case is we're taking our heterozygous individuals, our F1 generation, and we're breeding that amongst itself. Remember that with a diploid organism like this diploid plant, it's going to produce gametes that are haploid and we can lay out those haploid genotypes on the axes of our Punnett square. We do our cross, and this time we get a one to two to one ratio instead of the one to three that we saw before with uh, the simple complete dominance that Mendel was looking at.
So we have one homozygous individual that's red, and it has two copies of that R allele. We have one homozygous individual that's white, has two copies of that white allele. We have two heterozygous individuals, and instead of being red or white, they are pink. They're halfway in between the two. Here's the same example again, but this time with snapdragons, another type of flower. And in this case, they're using the lettering system that you're more familiar with. So we've got homozygous little r individuals that are white, homozygous big r individuals that are red. That's our parental generation. We cross them, we get our F1 generation. They're all pink. They're all heterozygous individuals. We take those, we mate them, we get our F2 generation. And again, we're gonna have this one to two to one ratio. So we have one quarter of the individuals that are red, one quarter that are white, and one half that are pink. Now, if we were looking at this and we wanted to be absolutely sure that this is what was happening and that the pink ones were indeed uh, heterozygous, we could do a test cross like we talked about before. We could take a uh, homozygous white flower and cross that with our pink flowers and we would get a one-to-one -one ratio of pink and white in this case. Unlike what we see in incomplete dominance, in co-dominance the two traits are not simply blended together. So think back to that example with the cow. If we took a white cow and bred it with a brown cow and we got a light brown cow, that might be an example of incomplete dominance. But in that photo I showed you, we can make out separate patches of white and brown. So that's an example of co-dominance. We have two genes where one is not dominant to the other and also the two don't simply blend together. Another really good example of codominance is blood types in humans and other mammals. So you're probably familiar with blood typing. Maybe you know your blood type. If you don't, you'll have a chance to figure that out in the lab. But there are four potential blood types and they're determined by one gene. So we've got three alleles of one gene. You can be type O, you can be type A, you can be type B, or you can be type AB. So for all of these, what we have is this core structure of sugars. What we're dealing with here is a protein that's embedded in the membrane and sticks out of the red blood cells. And attached to it are these sugars. Don't worry about the names of these sugars. But in every example here, we can see this core structure of sugars. Now, if you have type A, then you have this additional sugar stuck onto that. If you have type B, you have this different additional sugar tacked on to that core uh, sugar structure. If you're type AB, you have both the A and the B protein. What's especially interesting about this example is again we have these three alleles. The A and B alleles are codominant. They don't override each other. But both A and B are dominant to O. So if you have type A blood, you have some of those A proteins sticking out. But there's two ways you could be type A. You could be homozygous dominant, or you could be heterozygous. Again, the A is dominant to the O. If you're type B, you could be homozygous dominant, for B, or you could be B, O. Again, the B is dominant to the O. 
If you're A, B, there's only one thing you can be. You have one allele that codes for the A protein, one allele that codes for the B protein. And if you're type O, again, there's only one thing you could be, and that is O and O. So you have two recessive forms of the allele. So if you are homozygous dominant for A, you're going to have lots of those A proteins. If you're heterozygous, it just means you're going to have half as many. So half of the proteins you have on your surface will be A, and the other half will be O. Now, why are these proteins important? Well, there's lots of these glycoproteins attached to cells throughout your body. A glycoprotein is a protein with sugars attached, and they're used for identification. If you get, let's say, a tissue transplant, the tissue transplant you get from someone else, or the organ transplant, it's going to have different glycoproteins on its surface than you have on the surface of your tissues and organs, and your immune system will attack it because it will recognize it as foreign. Now, this is why you don't want to get the wrong blood type during a transfusion. If you have type A blood and you get type B blood, in your body you have antibodies that will attack that foreign uh, protein. So an antibody is a protein that sticks to something that's foreign. If you have type A blood, you produce anti-B antibodies. What the anti-B means is that these are antibodies that will attack the B protein if they see it. What they'll actually do is they'll stick to more than one B protein and they'll cause the red blood cells to clump together. And of course, you don't want your blood to clump. So if you have type A blood and you receive type B blood, B blood in a transfusion, your blood's going to clot, which is a bad thing. If you have type B blood, you produce anti-A antibodies, which will attack the A proteins. If you're type AB, you don't produce any antibodies. If you made either anti-B or anti-A, it would attack your own cells. And if you're O, you produce anti-A and anti-B because those are both foreign to you. So what does that mean? That means if you're type O, you can't receive blood from someone who's A, someone who's B, or someone who is AB, because you will attack those cells. You can only get blood from someone who is also uh, type O. If you are type A, you can get blood from someone else that's type A, or someone that's type O because you will not attack the, uh, the O protein. If you're type B, you can get blood from someone who's B or someone who's O. And if you're AB, you can get blood from anyone because you don't produce any of those antibodies. So type AB, you're the universal acceptor. You're in a good spot there. You can get blood from absolutely anyone. If you're type Oh, you're the universal donor. So if you're a generous person, maybe you want to be type O because you can give your blood to anyone. And incidentally, down the bottom there, the antigens. Antigens are the things that the antibody attacks. Here's a little simple example. We've got two parents, one that's type A, one that's type B. They're both heterozygous though, so in both cases they have a dominant allele and they have the recessive O allele. If they have children, there is a one in four chance that they will be type A, a one in four chance that they'll be type B, a one in four chance that they're type O if they get both of the recessives, and a one in four chance that they can be AB. So they'll have those co-dominant alleles. And maybe later we'll work through a uh, Punnett square of that. Sickle cell anemia is a genetic disorder that affects the red blood cells. Red blood cells are bags of hemoglobin. So hemoglobin binds to oxygen and carries oxygen around your body. The hemoglobin gene 
in its normal state is going to code for proteins that remain separate. But if you have a broken form of that gene, if you have the sickle cell form of that hemoglobin gene, it makes the hemoglobin proteins very sticky and they stick together and they form long chains. Now, if you have a lot of these chains of hemoglobin in your red blood cells, it affects the shape of the red blood cells. They become sickle shaped. So here we're seeing a very odd looking red blood cell. It's shaped like a sickle, which is a blade, and it has pointy ends. And that's not a good thing. Blood has to squeeze through very, very fine blood vessels known as capillaries, and these spiky red blood cells get stuck. So if you have full-blown sickle cell anemia, you have a big problem because your red blood cells are gonna get stuck. You're gonna have a hard time transporting oxygen, but also you can have these, these clots that cause major issues. However, if you're heterozygous, you are not as devastated by this condition. You produce some very, very long chains of hemoglobin like we see in sickle cell anemia, but you also produce some normal hemoglobin that's not sticky. And this results in cells that look fairly normal. Now the cells aren't quite as good at transporting oxygen as they should be, but they're not spiky and they hopefully won't get stuck uh, in your blood vessels. If you're heterozygous, we say that you have sickle cell trait. So this would appear to be a case of incomplete dominance if we're just looking at the traits that we see in the person. So if you have two normal versions of the hemoglobin gene, then you're healthy. If you have two sickle cell versions of the gene, then you're quite unhealthy. You're gonna have some health problems. If you are heterozygous and you have one normal version and one sickle cell version, you're somewhere in the middle. However, we can also look for this trait by separating out the chains of hemoglobin by size. And that's what you're seeing on the left. So this is done with electrophoresis. We don't have to worry too much about the technique here. Just realize that you can take a sample of blood, you can separate out the hemoglobin, and then you can basically run this through this gel-like substance and sort it by size. And what you're gonna see with someone who has normal blood is that the hemoglobin molecules are going to be separate. You're gonna get this band towards the far left of your gel. In someone who has full-blown sickle cell anemia, all the hemoglobin is sticking together in long chains and you'll get this band of much bigger, longer molecules. And if we have someone who has sickle cell trait, you'll see both of those bands. So on the gel, it looks like codominance. And this is the case for quite a few of these haplo insufficiency cases. Things are getting more complicated. We're not always dealing with a situation where one allele is completely dominant to another. We can have incomplete dominance and co-dominance as we've just talked about. We can have more than two alleles as we talked about with blood typing. And perhaps even more importantly, most traits are not determined by just one or two genes. They're determined by the interactions of many genes. We looked at this example before. The Punnett square shows the effect of three genes that determine how many melanocytes you have and how active they are. Melanocytes, remember, make pigments. There's another gene that codes for the enzyme tyrosinase. If it doesn't work, if you don't have a working copy, you don't produce any pigment. And remember, there's a fifth gene that determines whether or not your melanocytes favor pheomelanin, which is blonde or uh, red, or eumelanin, which is brown or black. And to be honest, there's more genes involved as well. So when we're looking at traits like skin color, we can't come up with the simple ratios that Mendel did. It's far more complicated.
in many cases, we have genes that can override the effects of another gene. Now, this is different from what we've talked about with dominance. In that case, we're looking at one allele that can override another allele, but those are alleles of the same gene. Here, we're talking about one gene completely overriding a second gene. In that case, we say that that gene is epistatic. So the gene that overrides the other gene is epistatic to the gene that's being affected. As an example of this concept, let's take a look at the wiring in your house. So you have somewhere in your house a service panel or fuse box, and there's one switch on that box that shuts off the power to the whole house. That's number one in this diagram. And then you have a bunch of circuit breakers, and each one of those is a switch that turns off an electrical circuit. So that'd be number two in this example. And then of course, in each of your rooms, you have a light switch, and that would be number three. So let's say you walk into your kitchen and you switch the light on using the light switch, and it doesn't come on. It could be that number two, that switch is turned off, or it could be that the number one switch is turned off. So how this relates to genes, well, switch number three has no effect if one or two are off. So in terms of genes, if we have three genes that are linked together the same way, gene three, even if it's fully functional, will have no effect if gene one or two are broken. So we can see here that switch two overrides switch three. We could say that switch two is epistatic to switch three. Switch one overrides the effects of switch two and switch three. So we could say that one is epistatic to two and one is also epistatic to three. And as we'll see, genes that code for enzymes that are used in biochemical pathways work a lot like these switches in your house. Let's have a second look at the metabolic pathway that's needed to make pigments, colors in corn snakes. I used this example before when we talked about dihybrid crosses. The pathway that you see on the right is the pathway needed to make these different pigments. It's a biochemical pathway. In a biochemical pathway, we have a number of steps. It's like a, um, an assembly line, basically. And each one of those steps is catalyzed by a different enzyme. And each one of those enzymes is coded for by a different gene. Remember that enzymes are proteins. Let's say we're looking at this particular enzyme down here. Let's say that it's functioning perfectly fine, but tyrosinase up here is not. If tyrosinase is not working, it won't produce this intermediate that's needed to make this intermediate that's needed to make this. So it doesn't matter if this particular enzyme is working. If the tyrosinase is broken, it doesn't get a chance to do its job. So we would say that the gene that codes for tyrosinase is epistatic to the gene that codes for this dopachrome. Don't worry about the names of these things. But you can see how if you don't have functional tyrosinase, everything below that is going to shut down. This assembly line is going to shut down. Here's an example of a very simple metabolic pathway. So we start out with a substance that is colorless, it's white. And we have an enzyme that catalyzes a reaction that turns that into a brown pigment. And then there's a second enzyme, enzyme B, that converts that brown pigment into a black pigment. Now, if enzyme B is broken, so if the gene for that is broken and we don't have any active enzyme B, enzyme C will still work and that colorless pigment will be converted into brown, but it can't be converted into black. 
and we would get animals that are brown in color. So this example that I'm using applies to mice and several other mammals. But what if enzyme C was working? Well, then we get white mice. And if enzyme C was broken, then just by looking at the mouse, the white mouse, we wouldn't know anything at all about enzyme B. If enzyme C is broken, it masks the effects of enzyme B, and we don't know whether it's broken or not. If we do a cross between individuals that are heterozygous for these two genes, we get a nine to three to four ratio instead of the expected nine to three to three to one. So you can probably make out that that last three and that last one have been combined together into the four in the ratio. And we'll take a look at what that looks like on a Punnett square. So here we have our cross for two mice that are heterozygous for each of those genes. Now remember, this relates back to the pathway we just looked at, and the C allele codes for the enzyme that catalyzes the first step, and the B codes for the enzyme that catalyzes the second step. It's unfortunate that the Bs and Cs are not in the proper order that you'd expect, but this is a classic example, and that's how they decided to name these genes. Anyway, if that C gene is broken, both alleles are broken, and we can't make that enzyme, we can't catalyze the first step. So what that means is it doesn't matter about the B. It could be fine, or we could have two broken copies of it, we're still going to get the white color because we can't do that first step. So because of that, if we have a functional B and a functional C, at least one copy of each, we're going to get the black color. We're going to complete that metabolic pathway. If we have a functional C, but no functional copy of the B, then we can complete the first step, but not the second step. So we get the brown color. And if we have a broken set of C genes, then we can only get that white color because we can't do the first step and the pathway stops there. Another great example of epistasis occurs in Labrador retrievers. Labrador retrievers come in three colors, black, brown, and yellow. There's two genes involved, the B gene and the E gene, and we'll start with the B. So there's a metabolic pathway, like we've talked about, that starts out with a colorless substance and turns it through a number of steps into a black pigment, which is melanin. We have this colorless substance being turned into a brown pigment, and then the B gene codes for the enzyme that takes us from the brown pigment to the black eumelanin. If that enzyme is non-functional, if we don't have a functional copy, then the pathway stops at brown and we don't get any further. So if we have a black lab, we know that we have at least one functional B allele, one normal B allele. We don't know what the other one is without doing some genetic testing. If we have a brown lab, that means we have two non-functional forms of that B gene. Now the E, as you might have figured out already, overrides both of those other alleles. It overrides the B gene. The E gene codes for something called a melanocyte stimulating hormone receptor. This is a protein that's on the surface of the melanocytes and it basically turns the melanocytes on. If that receptor is broken, the melanocytes don't do anything at all. They don't make any pigments whatsoever. So we don't get the black or even the brown. We get no melanin there are some other yellowish colored pigments uh, 
within the dog's fur. Those are determined by a totally separate pathway. We do see those, so we get that yellowish color instead of the black or the brown. And once again, just like we saw in the mice, we get a 9 to 3 to 4 ratio. The majority of the dogs, if we cross two heterozygous individuals together, are going to be black. Then we're going to get three out of the 16 that will be chocolate or brown. And then we'll get four that are yellow. And again, they're yellow because they don't have a functional form of that E gene and the melanocytes do nothing whatsoever. We've added a few new ratios to our repertoire now. Uh, ratios that Mendel wouldn't have known anything about. And we'll add one more. Let's take a look at lethal alleles. In some cases, if you have a homozygous state for a particular uh, gene, that can be lethal. It can stop the development of the animal in this case. So we've got an example here where we've got two heterozygous mice and we're going to mate them. We're looking at fur color. Fur color can be yellow or white. If we have a homozygous recessive individual, it's going to be white. If we have a heterozygous individual, the yellow trait is dominant, so we're going to have a yellow mouse. But if we have two of those dominant alleles, so we have a homozygous dominant state, the embryo doesn't develop, it aborts. So if we were to breed these heterozygous individuals and then count the offspring, we would only be counting yellow, which are heterozygous individuals, and homozygous recessive. The homozygous dominant would be missing from our count because they did not develop. And that means we get a two to one ratio this time around. So why is the homozygous dominant lethal? Well, in this case, this enzyme does more than just one step in a pathway that produces pigments. It does other things in the animal. And if there's two copies, there's too much. There's too much uh, of this particular product. So this is a case where we're dealing with a dominant form of the allele that is overactive. It does too much and that can upset other pathways and that can lead to the death of the animal um, or it's uh, stopping its development. And here is another example that you may have heard of. This is a Manx cat and a Manx cat is missing a tail. And in this particular breed, that is a genetic trait. It's coded for by this one particular gene and if we have two recessive forms of that gene, we get a normal cat with a normal looking tail. In the heterozygous condition, we have no tail. And in the homozygous dominant condition, we have no cat. That cat does not develop as an embryo, it aborts. So what's going on here is exactly like the last example. This is a gene that's involved in the development of the spine. And in the heterozygous condition, the spine doesn't form completely. The last bit of it, the tail, does not form. And there may be some other minor defects, but people have bred for this trait because they wanted tailless cats for whatever reason. If we have two dominant forms of that uh, gene, then there's severe problems with the development of the spine and the nervous system. So this is a case again, where the dominant allele is actually overproductive. Let's take a look at something quite different and quite fascinating. Again, our goal today is to look at non-Mendelian examples and this certainly fits that. Remember that you started out as a zygote. Well, you probably don't remember that. I mean, you weren't around, but anyway. You started out as a diploid cell. That's the result of a sperm and an egg coming together. And then that zygote divided once 
to give rise to two cells. Those two cells each divided, so we have four cells, and then eight, 16, 32, etc. And you today consist of over 100 trillion cells. We can have mutations that pop up during development. So let's say at the four cell stage, you develop a mutation in one of the cells. Maybe it's a, a mutation in a gene that codes for an enzyme that's needed for a pathway, like the pathways that produce pigments that we've talked about. Now these cells keep dividing and they grow into an individual. And now that individual is going to have that mutation in one quarter of its cells, roughly. Those mutations in the adult can be traced back to that mutation that popped up in the very early embryo. So we could have, for instance, patches of skin that were derived from that one mutated cell. So we have a population of cells that was derived from that mutated cell where maybe the melanocytes don't work properly or maybe they're overactive. And we could see differences in pigmentation on the skin. But it doesn't have to be the skin. We could talk about uh, patches of these genetically distinct populations of cells within the interior of the body as well. So we have genetically distinct populations of cells that exist within the individual due to mutations that occur early on. With an individual that's a mosaic, we can trace all of the cells back to one zygote. So we had a zygote that developed into an embryo somewhere along the line, there was a mutation, and we ended up with two distinct populations of cells, just kind of sprinkled around in this individual. But we can trace the individual back to one zygote. A chimera is even stranger. With a chimera, we have two distinct embryos that come together and then that new ball of cells develops into one individual. So imagine that we have two egg cells being released, one by the left ovary, one by the right ovary. They travel down the fallopian tubes. They both get fertilized. They start to develop and those embryos merge together. And then that mixture of cells gives rise to one individual. So we can see here with the cat that the two sides of the head are genetically distinct. There's a difference in fur color and eye color. Technically speaking, this cat is actually two cats that have fused together during their development. We can take this even further because it's possible to fuse embryos from different species together if they're very closely related. What you're seeing on the right is something known as a jeep. And it's actually part, uh, part goat and part sheep. So you can see some parts that are kind of woolly. Those are sheep cells. Part of it looks like a goat and those are goat cells. So we have these two very different things combined into one individual. Now that Jeep, of course, is not something that would occur naturally. It required a little bit of help, but what some researchers did was they took a very early embryo from a goat, a very early embryo from a sheep, brought them together. They formed one single new embryo, and then that developed into the Jeep. Um, they would have implanted that embryo back into a goat or um, a sheep to serve as a surrogate. Let's move on to something different again. I want to talk briefly about how sex determination occurs. We know how this works in humans and other mammals. So we have an X chromosome and we have a Y chromosome. If you have two X's, you're female. If you have an X and a Y, you're male. But let's talk about why that is. As we'll see on the Y chromosome, there isn't a whole lot of information, but there is one gene specifically that tells the body to develop testes. It actually tells the gonads to develop into testes, and the testes or testicles 
produce testosterone and that brings about the changes that we associate with maleness. If you don't have a Y, then by default, the embryo develops into a female, but we'll come back to that in just a moment. The Y chromosome, you don't need one. The X chromosome, whether you're male or female, you absolutely have to have an X chromosome. And the reason for that is it contains close to a thousand genes. There are a number of disorders that can occur if there's a problem with those genes. And as we talked about last day, these disorders tend to pop up more commonly in males because if they have a problem with their one X chromosome, they don't have a second one to compensate for that issue. In an early fetus, so about six weeks old, all the major organs have developed. They still need a bit of tweaking and so on, but all the major parts are there. If we look at the genitalia at the six week stage, we can't tell if we're dealing with a male or female. So males and females, of course, are structured a little bit differently down there, but we start out with all the same parts. They're just emphasized and arranged in different ways as we develop. At the six week stage, we could refer to the fetus as having a bipotential, two potentials. It could become male or female. We can't tell just by looking at the fetus at this stage. Incidentally, if you're curious what this is down here, this is actually the stump of the tail. So they've cut through the tail so we can get a better look. We have a fairly pronounced tail at that point. It becomes the tailbone or coccyx. But above that, we can see what's called the urethral groove. Now, if the embryo, or I should say fetus, develops into a female, that groove will become the opening to the vagina. If the fetus develops as a male, that is going to seal up and it actually leaves kind of a scar that you can see on the scrotum, a ridge down the middle of the scrotum. We also have a little nub up there, the genital tubercle, and it's going to develop into the clitoris in the female. It's going to develop into the head of the penis in the male. But see that we start off with all the same parts. They just end up being arranged a little bit differently. As mentioned, there's very little information on the Y chromosome. There's lots of information on the X chromosome. On the Y chromosome, there's a few genes that play a role in sperm production, but the most important gene is one known as the SRY gene, the sex determining region on Y, kind of a, a clumsy name. It's also known as the testes determining factor. And the reason it has that name is because this gene gets the ball rolling, so to speak. Sorry, bad pun. It tells the gonads not to develop into ovaries, but instead develop into testes. And then those testes produce testosterone and that brings about the other changes. In that six week old fetus, we have a pair of gonads that have not differentiated yet. They could become ovaries if the embryo develops as a female, or they could become testicles or testes if the fetus develops as a male. Within these gonads, we have these support cells that will help support the developing egg cells if the gonad develops into an ovary, or they'll develop into what are called serotoli cells, which help support the developing sperm in a male. We have primordial germ cells, which will give rise to egg cells, oocytes, if the gonad develops into an ovary, or they'll give rise to spermatozoa or sperm cells in a male. And then we have these other cells that will give rise to the cells that produce female hormones in the ovary, or give rise to the cells that produce testosterone in the testes. And don't worry, there's a lot of detail here. I don't expect you to know, just realize that at that six week stage, the gonads could go either way. They will by default develop into ovaries unless 
that SRY gene is present, in which case those gonads will develop into testes. In an XY individual, the SRY gene on the Y chromosome should tell the gonads to develop into testes. The testes should start producing testosterone and then the body should respond to that testosterone. But what if the receptors for testosterone are broken? That's a condition known as androgen insensitivity syndrome. Individuals with this appear in every way to be female, but genetically they're XY. This is Eden Atwood. She's a jazz singer. Um, she has a number of videos on YouTube. You might want to look her up. She talks about the condition that she has, this AIS, and actually her singing is quite good as well. But she is genetically male. She's XY. Now in these individuals, what happens is everything develops as it should. The embryo follows the default pathway though because there's no testosterone to tell the body to develop uh, male characteristics. They appear in every way to be normal females, although unfortunately the uterus, the upper part of the uterus, and also the ovaries do not develop. There are internal gonads, which are testes that began to develop, but never matured fully. Somewhat ironically, this particular disorder is caused by a problem with a gene that's on the X chromosome. So the gene that codes for testosterone receptors is actually found on the X chromosome. If that gene is broken, uh, the individual cannot make receptors on cells that could respond to testosterone. So even though in the early fetus there's testosterone being produced, none of the cells of the body respond and the testes eventually shut down as well because they need to uh, have testosterone present to continue their development. Change gears again. Males only have one X chromosome, but females have two in mammals like ourselves. The X chromosome contains close to a thousand essential genes. Both males and females produce the same amount of protein from those genes. And if you think about it, that really doesn't make sense because females have twice as many X chromosomes. You would think that they would make twice as much protein. But in order for things to be the same in both males and females, what happens in females is in every cell, one of the X chromosomes shuts down. The DNA is compacted so tightly that RNA polymerase can't get to the DNA, can't access the genes, so all the genes on one of the X chromosomes are shut off. And this is something known as dosage compensation. It ensures that males and females have the same dosage of the proteins that are coded for by the X chromosome. Note that there's different ways of doing this in other animals, especially in invertebrates. Um, I'll let you look at that yourself. I don't want to go into detail about that. And note that there's many other ways that sex can be determined. Um, for instance, in a lot of reptiles, it's the heat that you incubate the eggs at. If it's above a certain temperature, they become males. If it's below a certain temperature, uh, they become female. There's all sorts of different ways that sex can be, be determined in different species. There just has to be a system in place where we get roughly a 50-50 split of both. That shriveled up X chromosome, the one that's turned off, is known as a bar body. So it condenses down to this little spot and you can sometimes see those in the nucleus of uh, female cells. And that's what you're seeing here is one of those highly condensed X chromosomes. We'll have a look at another X linked trait, this time in cats. We're looking at one particular gene, which we'll call the B gene, and it codes for fur color. Orange is dominant over black. So the orange cat there 
if it was female, would have this genotype. So we've got a homozygous dominant uh, condition here. You might be thinking there should be another genotype. We'll come back to that. If it's male, we know that that one X, the only X it has, has to carry that dominant allele. For a black cat, this is a homozygous recessive trait if we're dealing with a female, or of course, if it's a male, there's only one X and we know that it has to be the recessive allele. Going back to that orange cat, you might be scratching your head and wondering why I didn't include this genotype. That's because if you have that genotype in a cat, a female cat, you see something quite different. In a female heterozygous cat, heterozygous for this particular gene, we end up with a case of mosaicism. And the reason for that is dosage compensation. One of those X chromosomes has to be shut down and it's random as to which one is shut down. This shutdown occurs early in development though. It occurs when we've got an embryo that consists of just a ball of cells. But the cells can shut down the X chromosome that has the allele coding for orange, or they could shut down the other one that has the allele coding for black. Again, it's a totally random process. The dosage compensation doesn't start right away, doesn't start in the zygote, it doesn't start until we're at the early embryo stage. So we have a ball of cells here, and now the X chromosomes are starting to shut down and form bar bodies. So for each cell, we have one X chromosome, and that's randomly chosen, that will condense down to an inactive bar body. And that's inherited by the cells that these cells give rise to. So if we have a cell that's got the X chromosome with the orange allele on it shut down, when it divides, the cells that it gives rise to will also inherit that pattern. So now we have mosaicism occurring. We're gonna have populations, patches of cells that have one X chromosome shut down for one particular trait. And next to that, we're gonna have another population of cells that have the other X chromosome shut down. And what results is a condition known as tortoise shell. So you've probably seen cats like this before. Again, what they're representing here with that weird U-shaped thing is a bar body. So that's a condensed um, X chromosome. So this cat is heterozygous for this particular gene on the X chromosome, but in some patches, the orange allele, that X chromosome has condensed and it's not being used. And in some other patches, it's the black allele that is inaccessible. You might be wondering what a calico cat is. This is a tortoise shell condition with the effects of one other gene added on. We won't get into the details of this, but there's a condition known as piebaldism, where you have patches of skin or fur in this case that lack pigment. So you mix that condition with the tortoise shell condition and you get this white, black and orange patterning. We usually only see this tortoise shell condition or the calico condition in female cats. And that makes sense. Remember that the males just have one X and they don't shut down an X. They need to have that X operational. So for males, they're either orange or black. And for females, because of this dosage compensation and mosaicism, we can get that tortoise shell condition. However, it is actually possible to have a male tortoise shell or a male calico. And this is one here, this cute little guy. So how do we get that? It's quite rare. So if you do have a male tortoise shell cat or a male calico, that's a, a pretty special thing. We have to have a male 
that is XXY. Now that's unusual. This is something known as aneuploidy, which we've talked about before, and I'll mention again briefly. This is where you have an unusual number of chromosomes. So in this case, we've got an extra X. Even though we have two X's, we still have the Y, so that SRY gene is there, so this cat develops as male. And because we have two X's, we still have dosage compensation occurring, just as it would in a female. Recall that during prophase one of meiosis, we have homologous chromosomes, each consisting of two sister chromatids, and these homologous chromosomes pair up into something called a tetrad, also known as a bivalent. Then we have crossing over occurring and bits of information are swapped between non-sister chromatids. So the same set of information is swapped between those um, non-sister chromatids and we get rearrangements of the, uh, the alleles. Now sometimes, because this is a really complex process, sometimes the homologous chromosomes won't separate. They get kind of tangled up and they might all go to one pole of the cell during the first division. Alternatively, sometimes during the second division, the sister chromatids don't separate from each other. There's proteins that hold them together. Remember, they're held together at the centromere. And sometimes those proteins don't break down to allow the chromatids to separate. This is what that looks like. So these diagrams here show non-disjunction, that's failure of the chromosomes or chromatids to separate. On the left, we're seeing this happening during the first division of meiosis. So the entire tetrad or bivalent is all going to one pole. And we end up after our second division with extra chromosomes in these gametes. On the other side, we're missing material now and we end up with one less chromosome than there should be in the gametes. This causes problems. Um, again, if you're missing information, that's bad. If you have too much information, that's bad as well, because for the autosomes, there is no dosage compensation and we get too much protein being produced. But you can see how you might end up with two X's and be a male. During meiosis, the X and the Y chromosomes, even though they're very different, very different sizes, they pair up into tetrads. And we could have all of the X's going to one end of the cell, and we end up with gametes that have an extra X. Now we can also have normal meiosis occurring during the first division, but an abnormal meiosis occurring during the second, that's shown in the right-hand diagram. And in that case, half of the gametes are gonna be normal, and the other half are gonna be unusual. We're gonna get one out of the four with an extra chromosome, and one out of the four missing a chromosome. If we have an egg cell that has an extra chromosome, and it comes together with a normal sperm cell, we're gonna end up with a zygote that has an extra uh, chromosome. So it's going to have this 2n plus 1 condition. And once again, the best known example of that is Down syndrome, also known as trisomy 21, where you have an extra 21st chromosome. In pretty much all cases, this is because non-disjunction occurred in the production of the egg. Down syndrome becomes much more likely when um, older women so past the age of 30, have children, and as they get older, the chances increase. The reason for that is that the cells that give rise to the egg, if you remember, start to undergo meiosis in the fetus. So if you're a female, before you were even born, meiosis was already beginning in your ovaries. And cells are held partway through meiosis for a very, very long time. And that means there can be damage to the spindle, there can be other damage that occurs that makes non-disjunction more likely when you make your own eggs. So quickly, just the concepts for this talk. We talked about quite a few things. 
Remember that most traits are polygenic. That means they're the result of several genes working together. So we don't see those nice clear-cut Mendelian patterns. In complete dominance, one allele completely overrides the effects of the other. Usually, but not always, the dominant allele is the functional form of the gene and the recessive is the non-functional. Although in some cases, the recessive form can be the functional form and the dominant form is extra active, it's overactive. In a dihybrid cross, we talked about that before, we get a nine to three to three to one ratio. So this is where we're crossing individuals that are heterozygous for two different genes. In incomplete dominance, we have two alleles of the same gene that both contribute to the phenotype of the heterozygote, and the result is a blending of the phenotypes. In codominance, when we bring two alleles together to make a heterozygote, we can see each of the traits distinctly that are the result of each of those alleles. For both incomplete dominance and codominance, remember, if we're breeding heterozygotes, we get a one to two to one ratio. Epistasis is what occurs when one gene overrides the actions of another gene or maybe several genes even. Multicellular organisms can be made up of patches of cells that differ in their genotype. This is called a mosaic if all of those cells can be traced back to a single zygote. A chimera is where we have cells mixed from two different individuals. Although it's not the case for all organisms, in vertebrates, sex is determined by sex chromosomes. So in us, of course, that would be the X and the Y. Individuals that have two sex chromosomes are said to be homogametic. So XX would be homogametic, that results in females. And individuals that have non-matching sex chromosomes are said to be heterogametic, so that'd be XY, and they develop as males. In mammals, there's an SRY gene on the Y chromosome, and it's responsible for telling the gonads to develop as testes. Once they develop as testes, they produce testosterone, and that brings about male changes. Testosterone is a type of hormone referred to as an androgen. An androgen is something that brings about male characteristics. XY individuals, so individuals that are genetically male, will develop as sterile females if they lack an SRY gene or if they don't have functional androgen receptors. We haven't talked about this, but interestingly, it is possible for XX individuals, so individuals that are genetically female, to gain an SRY gene and develop as sterile males. That's very uncommon, but the X and the Y actually pair up into a tetrad during meiosis one, and there's not usually crossing over. Remember, there's crossing over at this stage for all the autosomal chromosomes. That is usually inhibited for the sex chromosomes because they are very different, but it can occur occasionally and an SRY gene can be passed onto an X chromosome. So it is possible to have an XX individual that develops as male. There's all sorts of other weird things. We talked about how you can have XXY individuals, you can have XXX individuals, uh, you can have even higher numbers of sex chromosomes. Dosage compensation ensures that XY and XX individuals generate proteins coded for by the genes on the X chromosome at the same rate. That results in bar bodies. Those are condensed X chromosomes the ones that aren't being used. This happens randomly in the early embryo, and this results in a form of mosaicism. And finally, here's our terminology. Um, that's it for today, but when we come back, we'll talk 
a little bit more about genetics and we'll talk about some of the cool things we can do with our knowledge of genetics, how we can manipulate genes and so on.